Let's talk about some of the storage technology that is in use on modern computers and take a little bit of a look at the history of those technologies. We're going to start out with electronic storage and the most common example of that is just random access memory or RAM. This is the memory that you normally associate with the chips that are on your motherboard. It's also the kind of storage that's used inside the processor for things like the register file and the cache memories. Key features of random access memory, and we're thinking kind of here more of the memory that's going to show up on your motherboard, it's normally packaged as a chip. So you can find those on, the, on your motherboard, or if you've installed memory or upgraded memory, you've found the little uh, integrated circuit chips that make up the memory. The basic storage unit is normally referred to in real generic terms as a cell, and cell is basically just enough memory to store a single bit. And you're going to have multiple of these chips that are going to be used to build up a whole memory system. And we know there's two varieties of memories, static RAM and dynamic RAM. And we'll talk a little bit about the characteristics of these two in a minute. Recall that dynamic RAM is what's usually used for storage in your main memory on your motherboard, whereas static RAM is going to be used in your processor chip for things like the register file and your caches. One characteristic of the difference between these two is the number of transistors per bit. So a transistor is just a little electronic switch. And you can see that a dynamic memory bit requires just one of those transistors, whereas static RAM, depending on the design, requires either four or six. So you can see that because there's just more transistors required for a bit of SRAM, that it's going to be larger, take up more space on the chip. It's also going to be more expensive because we're actually including more physical hardware to implement that bit. Uh, but it turns out that it's also going to be faster, which is an important distinction between SRAM and DRAM that make the memory hierarchy work. So just in rough terms, the access time, in other words, the amount of time it's going to take to actually read the value of a particular bit, it differs between SRAM and DRAM by a factor of about 10. So if it takes one time unit to read a bit of SRAM, it's going to take 10 times as long to read that out of DRAM. There's also a thing called refresh. Uh, what, what we'll find when we look at dynamic memory is that periodically the hardware has to refresh the bits that are stored in dynamic memory. Data that's stored in DRAM is stored in a little tiny capacitor. It's an electronic circuit that can maintain a charge, and depending on whether there's a charge or not is how it determines whether it's storing a 1 or a 0. Because the charge will dissipate over time, Periodically, the memory subsystem has to go through and refresh the charge on each of those little tiny capacitors, which it does automatically for us, but it requires some additional work. And SRAM doesn't really use a capacitor. It uses a collection of transistors that sort of feed back on each other to reinforce the value that's being stored there. So it does not require any kind of a refresh interval. EDC stands for Error Detection and Correction. Turns out that, again, because in DRAM, we're storing things in a capacitor, that there's a pr propensity that that circuitry has to sort of lose its, its storage. And as a result, we often want to have some way of detecting the possibility that one bit has gone haywire within a particular byte or word or long word. So we're going to use additional circuitry, or actually additional bits, to keep track of the fact that we may have encountered an error and can even correct that error if we add additional bits to the storage. On the other hand, SRAM is much less subject to losing the value uh, and may or may not require error detection and correction circuits in order to uh, ensure reliable behavior. The cost, if a single bit of DRAM costs one unit, the cost for a unit of SRAM is around 100 times as much, so two orders of magnitude. So it's quite a lot more expensive, although it's also quite a lot faster to use SRAM. Applications for these two types of memory, cache memory is often implemented in SRAM because that's where we're after speed. Uh, whereas in main memory or a, say a video frame buffer, that's usually going to be implemented in DRAM because we're more interested in a larger capacity and because we can get much more DRAM for the same cost as SRAM, we're normally going to choose to use DRAM for these applications. Another important distinction when we are thinking about memory is that between volatile and non-volatile memory. Volatile memory is the type of memory that loses data when you shut it off. So the RAM memory that we've just been talking about that's used in the main memory on the motherboard of a typical computer is volatile memory. You shut off the power, all of the contents of main memory disappears. 
That's in contrast to non-volatile memory, which is going to retain data when it's turned off. That's obviously going to be a useful thing if we want to have something in our computer at the time that it starts up. We'd like to have memory that retains its content, so for example, we can use it to boot the computer. And that's exactly the purpose of a BIOS, or a basic I.O. subsystem. It's going to be non-volatile memory that's available on the motherboard of the computer that when the processor first powers up, it can jump into code that's stored inside that memory, start executing it, and that will instruct the processor how to bring the rest of the system up. Here's kind of a historical perspective on non-volatile memory. The oldest of these types of memories are called just read-only memory, or ROM. A read-only memory contains a program that's going to be executed by the processor, but it's going to be there when the power comes on. Now, ROM, in its original invocation, required that it be programmed during manufacture. When I'm using the word program here, I'm not talking about writing the program that's stored on the ROM. I'm actually talking about transferring the bits that make up the assembly language for that program onto the ROM device itself so that it can then be read by the processor at boot time. Because it's programmed at manufacturing time, it's kind of inconvenient. If you need to make a change, for example, to the code that's going to run at boot time, you've got to actually physically manufacture new read-only memory chips to accommodate those updates. As you can imagine, that's sort of time-consuming and could be quite expensive. So the next step in the evolution of read-only memory was called programmable ROM. And again, we're using programmable in the sense that we can store information on the read-only memory consisting of the assembly instructions that are going to be executed by the processor. In distinction to read-only memory, which had to actually sort of be manufactured with the program built into it, a programmable ROM can actually be programmed electronically. So essentially what's inside of a PROM is a bunch of little fuses, and you can apply a higher than normal voltage to the chip and then supply information about which of those little fuses you'd like to remain intact and which you want to actually blow. So the difference is that when it remains intact it might store a 1, when the fuse is blown it might store a 0 in that location. But you're physically modifying the contents of the chip, which means that you can only do that one time. So although you can just grab another PROM and reprogram it with a different program, with, a different, with different content, you can only do that once per chip. So that was kind of painful because if you screwed up something in the programming of the PROM, you had to just throw it away and try again. The next step in the evolution of non-volatile memory was erasable PROM or EEPROM. And here, instead of physically destroying little pieces of the, of the chip like you were doing when you programmed a PROM, erasable PROM allowed you to program it electronically but it also allows you to erase it. And the normally te technique for that was to expose this, the chip itself to ultraviolet radiation in a special little lamp that you would shine into a window on the top of the chip. And then you could put the PROM back into, or the EEPROM back into a, a programming device that would apply the voltage and then read the contents of the values you wanted to store in there consisting of the assembly language program you wanted to have run. So quite a lot more convenient in the sense that you didn't literally have to throw away a, a badly programmed ROM, but you had to have special hardware, and it was rather time-consuming to pop the chip out of the computer, erase it, put it in the PROM programmer, reprogram it, and then put it back in the computer. Next step was uh, electronically erasable PROM. So this is called EEPROM -E or E squared PROM. The idea here is that it's still non-volatile memory. It'll retain its contents across power-ups, but now instead of having to pop the PROM out of the machine and put it in a bulk eraser and reprogram it with special equipment, you can actually just leave it in place. So it can be electronically erased and reprogrammed right in the computer. So you pop, pop it into the motherboard, and you can actually uh, read and write and update the contents of EEPROM without any special additional hardware, and you can do it without having to take the time to pull a chip out and put it back in. And then finally, we've got flash memory. This is basically EEPROM, electronically erasable programmable read-only memory, that can actually be erased at sort of a block level. And the typical use for flash memory, as we'll see a little bit later, is for solid state uh, storage devices, SSDs. So where are we going to use non-volatile memory? 
One of the most common case is what's called firmware. You can notice from this word that it's kind of a halfway point between hardware and software. It's kind of like hardware in the sense that it retains its contents across power-ups, but it's kind of like software in the sense that it contains programs that are usually executed at power-up time. And the most common type of firmware that you'll encounter in the wild is the basic I.O. subsystem, as we've been talking about. It's the code that is available immediately at the time that the computer boots up, and it allows it to do, as the name implies, basic I.O. to, say, read from disk to pull in the operating system to start executing that. You'll also find firmware on other devices that also have their own processors on them. So for example, the disk controller itself has a processor that's going to have some firmware that's necessary for it to get started at the time it boots. Similarly for network cards, graphics cards, graphic accelerators, and so forth. And the other important use for non-volatile memory is in solid state disk devices. And these are very rapidly replacing rotating storage in a lot of different applications. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Another place where we're basically using the same kind of thing that's in SSDs is in thumb drives. A uh, lot of use on mobile devices, tablets, phones, and also on laptops. Let's turn our attention to rotating disk storage, or what's commonly referred to as hard drives. If you've ever cracked open a hard drive, you have some idea about what's in there. But if you haven't, here's a little photograph of what's inside of a typical hard drive. The first thing to notice here is the disks themselves that store the information in the drive. You can see that in this particular drive there's actually four disks stacked up one on top of the other and they're all connected together in this central spindle. So as the drive rotates, all four of those platters, we'll call them, are rotating simultaneously in the same direction at the same speed. The data that's stored in the drive is actually stored on the surface of these platters. A bit is encoded as a small magnetic domain that is polarized in one direction or another depending on whether it's representing a zero or a one. The platters themselves also allow you to store data both on the top side and the bottom side. So because we have four platters in here and each of them can store data on both sides, we actually have eight surfaces on which we can store data in this particular drive. The information can be read and written to the platters using a very small piece of electronics that's right on the end of this arm called a read-write head. And as its name implies, it can either read information or write information. When you want to write information, you polarize the read-write head in a particular direction, and that will magnetize the surface of the platter in one way or another to store a zero or a one. And if you're trying to read information, you can actually use the read-write head to sense the magnetic polarization on the surface of the drive electronically and the signal gets sent back into the electronics of the drive. The read-write head is actually stored on an arm that can move back and forth across the surface of the disk in a radial direction. The disk itself is rotating and the head can also move back and forth across the surface of the disk and essentially allow you to access any position on the surface of the disk simply by moving the head into the appropriate location and then waiting for the disk to rotate around such that that particular element of the drive is under the head and can then either be read or written. The arm is controlled by what's called an actuator. This is sort of a stepping motor that uh, activates very very quickly to move the read write head back and forth. And then uh, there's a considerable amount of electronics which you can't really see in this illustration because it's usually mounted in a circuit board on the bottom of the drive that has actually its own processor, its own memory, and probably its own read-only memory to allow the disk drive to initialize itself when power is applied. Then there's also always going to be a mechanism to allow you to connect the disk drive itself to the rest of the computer. In this case I'm showing a small computer systems interface connector, a SCSI connector, uh, that is a, a large parallel bus that allows you to move information back and forth to the drive very quickly. I'm going to include a link here in the video to another video that shows you how the drive actually operates when it's in use. Somebody's pulled open the top of a drive and then done some various operations, including showing you what happens when it powers up, when it reads different locations on the drive, when it removes a directory, and then when it finally powers down. And I'd encourage you to go look at that brief video so you have a better sense of what happens inside the hard disk drive while it's operating. This little cartoon is going to give us some insight into the geometry of a typical hard disk drive. We saw in the photograph 
that a disk drive is going to be composed of multiple platters, which are sometimes just referred to as disks, but that's sort of ambiguous in this discussion. So the platter is one physical disk, and the platter has two surfaces, the top and the bottom, both of which can be used to record information. The surfaces are further subdivided into what are called tracks, and a track is a kind of a concentric ring around the diameter of the disk that can then be further subdivided into what are called sectors. So a particular track is a concentric ring that can be split into many sectors, and I've illustrated that here by showing these kind of radial lines that are intended to convey the boundary between sectors. In reality, they're much, much smaller than this as, as it relates to the diameter of the disk, but this gives you the idea. So here's just a single sector of a single track on a single surface of a single platter within the disk drive. Recall that the platters that are inside the disk drive are stacked on top of one another and are connected to a central spindle on which they all rotate at the same speed and in the same direction. Because these are kind of ganged together in that way, it's convenient when we're thinking about the capacity of a disk drive to think about the corresponding tracks on all of the surfaces of all of the platters in the drive. So if we think about this track that's highlighted here and the top and bottom of this first platter, the top and bottom of the second platter, and the top and bottom of the third platter, that forms a kind of a cylinder of the corresponding tracks across all of the surfaces of the drive. And we'll see sometimes that the capacity of a drive or the way that the information is allocated on the drive is expressed in cylinders. Again, the spindle is rotating all the platters simultaneously. They're fixed to the spindle, so they all move together. The actuator then, I've illustrated here but this little cartoon, is responsible for moving the arms that contain the read-write head. And there's a single arm for each of the surfaces on each of the platters. So as the spindle spins the disc, all of the platters are rotating simultaneously at the same velocity in the same direction, which means that a particular location in a given cylinder is appearing under all of the heads across the entire disk drive. It's also true that the actuator, because it's connected to all of the arms, is going to move all of the arms at the same time. So the spindle rotates all the disks at the same time, the actuator moves all of the arms at the same time. And then of course the arm is where the read-write head lives. We're often interested in the capacity of external storage, like hard drives. So the disk capacity is defined to be just the maximum number of bits that we can store on the drive. Notice it's not bytes, it's bits. And vendors have a kind of a strange way of specifying this. When they quote you a gigabyte, they actually mean 10 to the 9th bytes, not 2 to the 30th bytes, which would be more like what we'd be used to thinking of as computer scientists. Why they do that is hard to know. Maybe it's a marketing ploy to make the drives seem like they have more capacity, but something to be aware of. How do we determine the capacity? Well, remember that we're storing individual bits in small magnetic domains on the surface of each of the platters. We can think about it in two ways. We can think about the, the number of bits per inch we can get as the disk rotates, and we can think of the number of bits we can get from the center of the drive to the outside. So the first of those is called the recording density. It's measured in bits per inch in the US. So it's basically the number of bits that we can fit on a one inch strip of the drive as it spins under the heads. And then the other is the track density, basically how many tracks can we fit across the radius of the drive. And so the track density also measured in tracks per inch is the number of tracks on a one inch segment. The aerial density, notice that this isn't aerial like up in the air, it's having to do with the area. It's the product of these two things. So the recording density times the track density gives us this aerial density and says how many bits can we fit in each square inch of the surface of the disk. Here's a simple example, not particularly modern one, but it gives you the idea. So if we have this information about the drive, for example, let's say that there's, for a given sector, let's say that there's 512 bytes in that sector, and that we can get 300 sectors on a track. So as we go around the circumference of the disk, we're going to see 300 sectors. And let's say each of the, surf each of the surfaces can contain 20,000 tracks. So as we go in and out with the read-write head, we can have 20,000 different places to stop. Then there's two surfaces per platter, 
run that one on the top, one on the bottom, and say five platters per disc. I've only illustrated three here, but you get the idea. And really it's a simple matter of multiplying all these things together. Uh, so we take 512 times 300 times 20,000 times 2 times 5, all these values, and we end up with this number that is 30.72 gigabytes. And again, this is disk drive manufacturer gigabytes, not computer science gigabytes. Let's think about how the disk operates. Hopefully you watched the video that I've linked earlier in this video so that you've actually seen it in, in practice, but let's kind of take it a step at a time. We know some facts about this, that first of all, the disk spins at a fixed rate, uh, and that there's a read-write head that's attached to each of the arms in the uh, connected to the actuator. And the read-write head is basically just kind of flying over the surface of the disk. So as the disk spindle spins all of the platters, the read-write head flies just a tiny fraction of an inch above the surface of the disk on a little cushion of air. The read-write head is being moved by the actuator back and forth so that the actuator can allow the read-write head to access different tracks as they rotate around the disk. We'll show here the read-write head is at a position above some track on the drive and we'll show rotation being counterclockwise here. So the disk is spinning in this fashion and as it spins, different bits on each of the tracks, but in particular the track over which the read-write head is positioned, are going to rotate underneath that head and be available for reading or for writing. Here, here's a little cartoon to illustrate what's going on. Let's imagine that this blue sector is about to pass under the read-write head as the disk spins around. The head will have sensed what was on each of the bit positions on that sector and sent them back to the disk controller hardware. After reading that sector, the disk will now have rotated into this position. Now let's say that we next want to read the contents of this sector that I've marked out in red, which is at a different location around the disk from the blue sector, and it's at a different track. We have to then wait for the head the read-write head to move to a different sector. So the actuator is going to rotate the arm that's going to pull the head so that it's now pointing at this track. As the head was moving from here to here, the red sector has also rotated around a little bit. And then we need to wait for the red sector to continue rotating until it's actually underneath the read-write head, at which point we can read the value. And then here would be the position after that red sector had been read. We've got to wait for the head to move, we've got to wait for the drive to rotate, and then we've got to actually do the reading. We're reading the blue sector. That would be sort of a data transfer operation. When the actuator rotates the arms that contain the read-write heads, that's called a seek. We're seeking to the appropriate track. Then we have to pay the price of some rotational latency. There's a delay or a latency while the disk rotates such that the red sector moves around the disk to where the read-write heads live. And then finally there's another data transfer cost as we read the bits off of the sector that we were interested in marked there in red. Let's look at the performance characteristics of a hard drive. We'll refer to this as the disk access time, basically the amount of time it takes to read a particular value off of the disk surface. And this is going to be a combination of two things, the seek time and the rotational latency. The seek time is the amount of time it takes for the actuator to rotate the arms to a particular track on the disk surface. And a typical value for that to, say, move across half of the surface of a drive is between 3 and 9 milliseconds. In addition, the rotational latency has to do with the amount of time it's going to take for the disk to rotate until the point where the sector of interest is beneath the read-write heads on the track that we're trying to read from. And we can calculate it using this average rotation calculation. The one half here is the assumption that on average we're going to have to wait for the disk to rotate one half the way around in order to get this sector of interest underneath the read-write heads. The speed in revolutions per minute is 7200, and if you work this out, you end up with a typical value of about four milliseconds rotational latency. We also need to think about the transfer time. So once we've moved the read-write head into the appropriate track and we've allowed the disk to rotate the appropriate sector underneath the read-write head, 
we've got to actually pay a price of allowing the bits to physically move underneath the read write head so we can so we can transfer them into into memory and that's calculated in a similar fashion to the rotational latency that means that the overall access time for getting a hold of a value on the disk is going to be a combination of the seek time the rotational latency and the time to do a disk transfer so if we sum those things all up although there is some overlap here between seek and rotation this is a simpler formula for that that'll give us the average access time for a particular drive here's just a simple example if our rotational rate is 7200 rpm pretty typical for rotating storage and the average seek time is nine milliseconds and we need to figure out what the number of sectors per track are to be able to calculate the transfer time uh, we can see that the rotation is going to require about 4 milliseconds. The average transfer will be only 0.02 milliseconds, so a couple of orders of magnitude faster. And then the overall access time is going to be the 9 millisecond seek time, the 4 millisecond rotational latency, the 2 hundredths of a millisecond transfer time, giving us 13.02 milliseconds access time for this particular drive. Now we want to also think about in terms of the relative magnitude of these values. You can see that the transfer time is completely swamped by the total of the seek time and the rotational latency. So the access time is dominated by those two things. Essentially what we're saying is that getting the first bit underneath the read-write head is very expensive, but the remaining bits on that sector that's being read basically happen for free. And when we compare this with random access memory, we can see that, uh, and here's just some typical values for RAM, about 4 nanoseconds per double word for uh, static RAM, about 60 nanoseconds per double word for dynamic RAM. And if you compare that back to the values down here for the average access time for the drive, we can see that the drive is about 40,000 times slower than SRAM and 2,500 times slower than DRAM. And it's this difference in performance that we're really leveraging when we talk about the memory hierarchy and latency and caching and so forth. We're able to operate at speeds in this neighborhood in terms of the performance of our algorithms in, in the processor, even though the speed with which we can access the values on rotating external storage are quite a lot slower. Finally, let's take a brief look at solid state storage. Here's an illustration of a typical solid state disk. You can see that the disk itself is organized into blocks and that those blocks are themselves organized into pages. The data is transferred back and forth to the solid state device using units of pages. And you can see kind of a typical size for the page and the number of pages per block. One of the interesting things about a solid state device is this flash translation layer. If you think back to the history of the evolution of computers, most of the assumptions that have been made about secondary storage have assumed that the I.O. bus is talking to rotating storage or a hard disk drive. Now, it certainly would have been possible with the introduction of solid state disks that use flash memory here as the main non-volatile storage mechanism, it would have certainly been possible for manufacturers to require that computer vendors make changes to the buses, to the firmware, to the software, to the operating systems in order to allow those things to be made directly aware of the fact that they were talking to flash memory inside of a solid state disk. The choice that was made by the SSD vendors was quite different. Introducing this flash translation layer basically allows the SSD to masquerade as if it was rotating storage. So from the point of view, the I.O. bus hardware, the operating system, the drivers and so forth that are built into all the rest of the computer system above it, the SSD behaves as if it was a hard drive requests for I.O. still are asking for the contents of a sector on a track, but that's mapped by the flash translation layer into the appropriate locations in this flash storage where the corresponding bytes were stored as if they were a hard drive. Some of the performance characteristics here, it turns out that just like with rotating storage, there is a difference between the sequential access time and the random access time. So the way that the flash translation layer maps requests into the blocks and pages requires more time to randomly access locations within the, within the storage than it does to just read things out sequentially. So the sequential performance for reads and writes, again from a few years ago, was about 550 megabytes per second or 470 megabytes per second. 
and random access was going to be slightly slower. So think about the trade-offs between solid state disk and rotating storage. Well, SSD has a considerable advantage in that it has no moving parts. So there's no mechanical parts to fail. There's no mechanical parts to be damaged if the equipment is dropped or jarred. So it's much more robust in an application like a mobile device or a laptop that's going to be moving around. It's more rugged. Some disadvantages of solid state disk. First of all, the underlying flash memory has characteristics that will cause it to wear out after a while. If you try to read and write from the same blocks, the same pages on those blocks, over time, the blocks themselves are going to degenerate to the point where they will no longer store things persistently. And part of that intermediate layer that we talked about before, the flash translation layer, is going to be to mitigate that tendency for those things to wear out by what's called wear leveling logic. So it will try to distribute read and write behavior to different parts of the underlying flash memory in order to alle alleviate that. It's also quite a lot more expensive. This was a figure in 2015, so this is quite dated now. Uh, it's no longer 30 times more expensive, certainly, to buy SSD than it was to buy rotating storage, but it's still several times more expensive to use SSD. And of course, they have very broad applications in you know, the iPods and smartphones and laptops. And uh, because the cost has come down quite considerably over, over the years, we're seeing them a whole lot more, certainly in desktops and to a certain degree in servers. So though it looks like there's considerable advantages to using solid state devices for secondary storage, I don't think it's fair to say that we're going to see the demise of rotating storage anytime soon. The cost comparison is still compelling argument for large applications like server farms or corporate server rooms or data centers, and the familiarity and reliability of rotating storage is going to continue to be a compelling argument for its continued use for many years to come.